meeting to order of the Senate State Government Finance and Policy and Elections Committee, today being Tuesday, March 29th, 2022. Uh, good to see all of you here today. Uh, we have a very full agenda, which is usual for this stage of committee deadlines. And so I'm going to have Ms. Wilson go ahead and take the roll. Senator Kiffmeyer. Present. Senator Howe. Present. Senator Carlson. Present. Senator Clausen. Present. Senator Fate. Present. Senator Curran. Present. Senator Pratt. Present. Senator Osmick. Present. A quorum is present. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Wilson, and a quorum is present. So the first bill we're going to have here today is Senate File 3667, Senator Eichhorn. And Senator Eichhorn, I understand, uh, do you have a testifier that's present here today or online? Uh, I believe the testifier, Madam Chair, is present in the audience, as far as I if understand. If your testifier would like to come up, be glad to have her come up as well, Ms. Hayes. Yep, and I believe, uh, I, I don't know if she plans to testify or just be here for questions, but All right. she can certainly come on up. And we do have one small amendment, Madam Chair. Okay, I will move Senate File 3667 on the agenda before us, and we have an amendment. Uh, Ms. James, is this the, if you could explain the amendment? Madam Chair and members, this is the A5 amendment, and... Um, this um, takes care of the blank, the blank for a date that is online 1.14, but handles it in a slightly different way, um, setting the time as um, when the commissioner issues a request for proposals instead of by a certain date. Okay, thank you very much. I will move the A5 amendment to Senate file 3667. Members on that motion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The A5 amendment is adopted to Senate File 3667. With that, Senator Eichhorn, if you go ahead and present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair, and for the opportunity to present Senate File 3667. I'd like to thank my co-sponsors, Senator Coran, Lang, and Dibble. This bill arose out of a report uh, that was prevented on the driver and vehicle services uh, by Rick King. Uh, and there is a copy of the report available online as well. I believe it went out to all legislators. But this was derived from that report. And it directs uh, a few different things. It directs that uh, the commissioner of DNR take a look at, they, because they are going to be looking at replacing the system that, uh, to help register like ATVs and boats and that type of thing. Um, it would, it would say that they must put out a request for proposals, and when scoring those responses, um, they may give preference to a vendor that currently provides vehicle registration software to the state. That would be the, the new MinDrive system. Uh, it says that within 45 days of when the vendor has been selected, uh, the DNR must report back to the legislature, and they must report on a handful of things, the names of the vendors who submitted the proposals, which vendor was selected, an estimated timeline for implementing the new registration system, and if preference was given, what the preference was and how they arrived at that, uh, and if the software vendor currently provides vehicle reg registration software to the state. One of the main things that, that we can see here, and as, as they went around to build this report, was some synergies with the deputy registers. Currently, they're switching between a couple different systems in order to manage this process, and if they could have it in one system, it would be considerably easier for the deputy registers. Um, it'd be, the, the consumer wouldn't necessarily know the difference other than it would take the deputy register less time to do that, and in hopes it would also save the state money by going with a system that already has this in place. Uh, I know the, the DNR is having those conversations, and we've had some good discussions with the DNR as this bill has moved through the process. Um, so we think it's in a good spot, and we would certainly appreciate your support on this, Madam Chair. We think it's, it's good governance, uh, and I think it can certainly save the state money instead of building an entirely new system, kind of like we saw on the Minlars deal a couple years ago. So we think this is good governance and, and appreciate the opportunity to talk about the bill today, and with that, I'll stand for questions. 
Thank you very much, uh, Senator Eichhorn. I think this is really quite amazing. Um, having been here long enough for Minlars, nobody would have thought of do doing with this the really failed uh, Minlars system. And so it's good to see uh, that time has moved on and that Min Drive for the deputy registrars, uh, for them uh, to see this kind of you know, efficiency working it together. I see Mr. Meyer is in the back of the room as well. Mr. Meyer, would you like to come forward and comment on this? Mr. Meyer, welcome to the committee and your name and title for the audio record. Good morning, Madam Chairman and members. For the record, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner, Department of Natural Resources, and, and Jenny Covey, our, our Chief Technology Officer here as well. Um, we have been working with Senator Eichhorn on this bill, and we are in the process of getting ready to release an RFP for our three-prong licensing system, our hunting and license registration, our volunteer coordination program, and also our recreational vehicle program. We have been in conversations with Department of Vehicle Services about this opportunity and look forward to working with vendors as they pre present solutions that contain this into the future. Thank you very much, Mr. Meyer. Uh, with that, members, um, any questions? Uh, Senator Clausen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a clarification, if a conservation officer or a state patrol makes a stop uh, for a violation, would they see all licenses then? Uh, they could look and see if uh, their boat license registration is out of date, as well as a traffic violation. So you would see all registration information on a, on a stop by an officer? Mr. Meyer. Madam Chair, Senator Claus, those are two different systems. Okay. They, they interact, obviously, right? The registration data goes into another database. Then we do have a, a records management system and uh, a process that, that we use to, to work into the system on registered vehicles and things like that, uh, record history, things like that, licenses, so yes. But they are two different systems. Okay. Thank you, Senator Clausen. Uh, Senator, okay, we're good. All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Meyer. I appreciate that information and clarification. Uh, Senator Eichhorn, any other comments? No, thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to present this today. Okay, thank you very much. Members, I will proceed to a vote then. I'm gonna move that Senate file 3667 be recommended to pass and be referred, re referred to the Environment and Natural Re Resources Committee. On that motion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion prevails. Senator Eichhorn, you're on your way to environment. Okay, members, um, I have a bill that I'm going to go present now and get, well, actually. Senator Bach, I see that you're here and ready to go. Why don't we take your bill then? Um, Senate file 4072, Senator Bach. Welcome to the committee, Senator Bach. Glad to have you here today. And I'll move Senate File 4072. And Senator Bach, do you have any <laughs> amendment today that we need to take care of? Well, thank you, Madam Chair. No, I do not. Uh, okay. it's, a, it's a pretty simple bill that we've done a couple times previously up at the IRRRB. Uh, IRRRB is a state agency, but it's a unique one in that it's not funded by the state's general fund. It's funded by the taconite taxes that are paid in lieu of property taxes. But because they actually are state employees, even though they're not paid for by the general fund, uh, uh, in order for us to offer a uh, early retirement incentive, or in this case, a retention package to potential uh, employees, we have to come to the legislature to get authority to do that. Uh, we've done it, uh, I guess I've been the author of it twice recently. We did it back in 2012 uh, when we, uh, the agency contracted out the operations of what was then called Iron World over in Chisholm, and we needed to downsize our workforce, so we came to the legislature, and that currently is run by a nonprofit. We came to the legislature then looking for authority to be able to do a, a early retirement incentive thing so that uh, people could transition into retirement, and uh, we did reduce the complement at the agency at the time 
Back then, I think we were about 65 employees at the agency total. Uh, and then we did it back in 2017, I believe, yes. And at that time, uh, Giants Ridge, which is a, a ski hill up in Biwabic and two magnificent golf courses, we made a decision then to put those under private management so the agency would not manage those either. That was the same situation where uh, we didn't want to, uh, we, we took some people it, through attrition into the uh, other functions in the agency and then some were offered an early retirement package in order to, tra to transition into retirement for people that were eligible. Uh, so the legislature has done this twice before. Uh, in this case, this year, we're looking for some permissive authority for the agency. We're currently at 42 FTEs, I believe. Uh, in this case, we, our senior leadership team, which is like 10 to 12 people that run the different departments at the agency, they're all of the age they're eligible for retirement. And we're pretty concerned at the board level that all of our senior management at the agency are all going to make a decision to retire at the same time. So this really is, gives the commissioner some permissive authority to be able to offer retention type uh, packages to employees, potentially for some future date maybe, to, uh, to, to retire. Uh, and that really is all it is. There's no cost to the general fund, uh, Madam Chair, but uh, we're, we're a bit concerned that we're going to lose uh, a large complement of the agency's most tenured employees all at the same time. So I'd like to be able to find a way to phase that out so that people can retire over, a, over several years. Thank you, Senator Bach. Uh, members, any questions or anything else? Senator Bach, you, um, we uh, don't have any questions for you right now in the full agenda, so I appreciate your explanation. Uh, we are laying this bill over for possible inclusion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Bach. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and uh, step into presenting... So we'll go to Senate file 4130, Senator Kiffmeyer, to your bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. <laughs> okay. Senate file 4130, uh, I'll move it to be in front of the committee. And uh, I'm, I'm, this is the Secretary of State technical bill. And uh, there are quite a few provisions. I'm doing this as a courtesy to the Secretary of State office. Uh, to put the things that they have brought forward in their bill, Senate File 4130. And in this particular case, Mr. Chair, uh, I can explain what the provisions are there. They're mainly uh, technical, but um, there are several places in this bill where instead of using the word residency, which is both constitutional and many, many statutes that we have in regards to residency, uh, but the change here would be to use the phrase maintain residence instead of voter residence or voter resides. And so I don't agree with that. Uh, residency is a revenue determination. There's about a page and a half of residence. There's nothing that defines maintain residence. I think it would introduce a lot of questions. Uh, can you live in Wisconsin and maintain a residence in Minnesota? Can you live in Florida and maintain a residence in Minnesota? Can you live in one county, maintain residence in another with our cabins and other things like that? It just introduces a lot of legal questions that are, are greatly unresolved. 
There are a few other things um, in regards to, say, Section 19. Uh, section does not apply to a vacancy and nomination for a federal office. So some of these things are technical, uh, Mr. Chair, and some of these things that um, I feel would fit well with our current state statute. Um, I would uh, include them, and my intention is to lay this bill over for possible inclusion and take those portions that I feel will work with the rest of our elections bill today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, any questions uh, regarding Senate File 4130? Seeing none, uh, this bill will be laid over. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Abler, it looks like we're going to be ready for you next. These are one of those times, folks, that um, we put items out on the agenda, but because of members having to be in other committees, we're having to shift these around to help make things work um, during this deadline week. And Senator Abler, it doesn't hurt that you're in the room as well uh, when we have a number of your bills on the agenda. And so as long as we are here, members, we will do... Um, those bills that are um, on the agenda, in this case for Senator Abler. We have three bills. Senator Abler, which one would you like to do first? We can just do an order on the agenda, Madam Chair. Uh, 2845 right. will be good, and then we'll move on to the others. Okay. Um, I'll move Senate file 2845. And um, Senator Abler, in regards to this, are you um, having an amendment today? No, I'm not, Madam Chair. All right, wonderful. Then you can go ahead and, when you're ready, present your bill. Well, Madam Chair, I want to thank the committee for their time. I haven't been here all year, and then I get the privilege of coming here with three bills. And so I felt some sense of responsibility that that could be kind of grueling on the members. And so I provided muffins and donuts in the back table, uh, just as Coffee kind of a thank donuts. you. Wow. <laughs> thank you very anyway, so they're fresh this morning. I didn't bake them myself, which makes them even more desirable. Um, so, Madam Chair, uh, Senate File 2845 seeks to address a really uh, very challenging problem that the state has with uh, substance abuse and mental health. Um, and we have uh, layered on and layered on at the, in our departments, well, you know this, <laughs> you do all the departments here, um, policies and, and structures you would never do if you started from scratch. And so we, in all my time, we've continued to try to massage this and massage that until we make them pay more attention to something. And in the case of substance abuse and mental health, um, there's a division at the Department of Human Services which tries very hard, but frankly, they're kind of a little ways down the org chart. And with all the other duties they have, it's been hard to get the attention that this area needs. And if you look at my co-authors, you can see this is not a partisan matter. Uh, I have um, uh, Senator Eaton, Lopez Franson, Rosen, and Bigham. And in the House, it's got strong authorship as well. And so these individuals and, uh, feel very strongly that, that our substance use work and some of our mental health efforts simply are not working. And this is no impugning DHS or the staff there. It's just simply saying the structure makes it almost impossible to function. And so basically what this bill does is it takes the whole Department of Behavioral Health, which is a blend of human services and uh, substance abuse, and simply moves it into its own department. Uh, when I asked for a fiscal note, uh, it was the opinion of Mr. Nauman that it did not require one because it couldn't cost money because the bill says it's going to be all done within the same budget. It should not cost one more penny to operate. The director of this department would become, of this, uh, of this section would then become the commissioner. Um, and DHS has all kinds of space in their offices, especially these days, just to move around a little bit. Um, and so, but I think at the end, uh, it's going to function much better. And uh, so you'll hear from the commissioner, and she may have a different opinion about this, but I'm going to contend that when she goes to the, this would create a cabinet level uh, behavioral health member to call attention to this. And uh, Senator Eaton testified in our committee, and she is well versed on this, and I think well respected. And she has been on every task force, every work group, everything you can do, uh, and even given her own challenge of 
losing a family member to this um, to substance abuse. And the numbers only increase after all we've done. And so how can we do something different? And so this is something different. And I appreciate the bipartisan support. And Madam Chair, I appreciate your uh, attention to it today. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Senator Abler. Members, uh, any questions for Senator Abler in regards to Senate File 2845? I think um, we're going to go next to uh, Commissioner Harpstead. And Commissioner, welcome to the committee. Don't get to see Commissioner of Health or Human Services uh, too often, so glad to have you here today. So if you want to say your name and title, of course, and then proceed with your testimony on Senate File 2845. Thank you, Chair Kiffmeyer and committee members. I'm Jody Harpstead, the Commissioner of the Department of Human Services. I've shared in other testimony this session some of the challenges that a proposed behavioral health agency would include, such as uh, we would like to finish our work of hardwiring our process improvement work in the Behavioral Health Division, which is integrated with our DHS contracts and compliance office. The state of the art is integrating care across behavioral health and physical health, not separating it. The Behavioral Health Division as a separate agency would be tiny and would have to add finance, legal, compliance, HR, tribal and county relations and other functions, very expensive. This would be the most complex potential split of DHS with the federal requirement of a single Medicaid agency, and even then would handle less than 20% of all state behavioral health funding, most of which goes through our healthcare administration. This would be the governor's 27th commissioner, but is only DHS's fourth administration assistant commissioner in terms of focus. Examples of the challenges of a tiny behavioral health agency at DHS, our Behavioral Health Division has access to lawyers specializing in employment law, contract law, Medicaid law, etc. A tiny agency would have trouble finding a lawyer who could advise them on all the above, or it would be cost prohibitive to hire several lawyers. Another example, a behavioral health agency would have to hire enough HR staff to handle hiring classification, employee complaints and actions, learning and development, etc., and handle them well. At DHS, we have people who specialize in all those areas, the cost of which are spread over several administrations, healthcare, older adults, disability services, et cetera, which is a cost-effective way of managing a portfolio of human services. And as I've previously testified, Medicaid in Washington requires Minnesota to have a single Medicaid agency, which is DHS. Other states do have separate agencies focused on behavioral health, but they have to closely collaborate to ensure compliance with all Medicaid policy. After what we've been through with Medicaid overpayments to counties and tribes in the past three years, we certainly don't want to go down that path again. Thank you very much for your attention today. Madam Chair, uh, <laughs> Ms. James uh, suggested an amendment on line 4.23 to, to what a delete, I guess, of duties, because uh, that's actually more specific to the statute. So. Thank you. Madam Chair and members, the amendment um, is on line, page four, line 23, delete of duties required by and insert under. And the, the reason for this is that section 15.039 applies to the transfer of duties, but also to the transfer of personnel and assets and liabilities from one agency to another. And so we didn't, there's no intention to limit that to just the transfer of duties. So this. This change would make clear that it's everything about 15.039 that applies here. I'm grateful for it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Aye. No, Madam Chair, I think this will go to the floor.
either way, Madam Chair, it's fine. Aye. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, Senate File 3355, the uh, Licensed Professional Counselor in this Interstate Compact. And I have some amazing testifiers. Testifier. I have no amendment, Madam Chair, unless Ms. James finds some other way to improve the bill. So I really appreciate them looking at this. That's why we're here. Uh, sure, I'll just offer a few comments and then I have a testifier that will go into detail. Uh, licensed professional clinical counselors were created out of a need for mid-level counselors. In the beginning, we had licensed professional counselors, and upon further review, they needed more uh, uh, experience, et cetera, to be covered by Medicaid. And so uh, Senator Cascaden and I, in a different life, uh, worked together with a whole bunch of these good folks uh, to create this mid-level licensure. And they are so effective that they've uh, proliferated probably everywhere. And so in the time of telehealth and traveling and so on, uh, there's an early process about creating a compact. And happily, Minnesota is one of the leaders in helping decide the criteria for that compact. So I'm pretty happy about this. This is the, the bill before you, and just to save time, I'll uh, turn it to my testifier, if you'd like. And if you want me to focus on any particular sections, he may, otherwise he'll just offer his comments, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Abler. Um, to your testifier, this is Mr. Hegblum, is that correct? That's correct. Oh, yes. I pronounced it okay. All right, Mr. Heglin, welcome to the committee. Your name and title, and then proceed with your testimony. Wonderful. Good morning, uh, Chair Kiffmeyer and Senators. Uh, my name is Dr. Tom Hegblum. I'm an assistant professor at the Hazelden Betty Ford Graduate School of Addiction Studies, and I'm the legislative chair for the Minnesota Counseling Association. Uh, I'm here representing the Minnesota Counseling Association today, uh, where we are hoping. Uh, for favorable approval of Senate File 3355, which, as uh, Senator Abler so graciously uh, mentioned, is the interstate compact for licensed professional clinical counselors uh, in the state of Minnesota. Uh, professional counselors are currently licensed by independent boards operating in each state, and holding a license only allows an individual to practice in that home state. This practice has worked well in the past, but uh, as we've all experienced the, with the rapid growth of telehealth and the interconnectedness of our society, more expansive privilege to practice is certainly needed. The licensure regulations uh, as they exist can contribute to significant hardships for both the professional counselors in Minnesota, but also the clients that they serve. As it stands, licensing regulations do not allow for professional counselors to provide services to clients who are not physically present in the state of Minnesota at the time of service. If a client is on a work trip, on vacation, attending college, snowbirding in another state, or is even relocated because of their service in the military, uh, counseling services cannot be provided until that individual returns to the state of Minnesota. This can create significant challenges in continuity of care when a therapeutic relationship is stopped and started, stopped and started over and over again and the ultimate person that that hardship impacts is the client. This is similar to SIPACT, which passed last year in Minnesota for psychologists. Uh, this bill will allow professional counselors to seek privilege to practice in other counseling compact member states, uh, really fixing the disruption in continuity of mental health care. Uh, currently, and this is uh, news as of the last couple of days, six states have signed uh, this bill into law including Maryland, Georgia, Alabama, West Virginia, Utah, and Mississippi. Florida has the bill on the governor's desk uh, currently. Once 10 states uh, completely sign this bill into law, the counseling compact becomes active, and it's a real thing uh, across the country. We're hopeful that Minnesota will join the force soon. 
Uh, in addition to allowing professional counselors the opportunity to serve clients not physically located in Minnesota, the Counseling Compact will reduce barriers that limit uh, life-saving mental health care for those located in rural communities, especially by improving access. It will allow counselors to provide specialized care to clients who might not have access to treatments for specific conditions in their area, uh, namely things like eating disorders or even culturally specific or culturally relevant care. Finally, the compact creates uh, ample opportunities for expanded practice for professionals living on or near the state border, uh, particularly when state, other states enact this legislation, uh, improving workflow for professional counselors in medium to large size border communities such as East Grand Forks, Moorhead, Duluth, and the Twin Cities metropolitan areas. Uh, I'd like to mention that the Counseling Compact is a budget neutral initiative. It's endorsed, uh, it's supported by the Minnesota Board of Behavioral Health and Therapy, or BBHT. Uh, the BBHT will be involved in the compact by maintaining a high level of regulation and oversight of the counseling profession in Minnesota, uh, uh, continuing to oversee the licensed professional clinical counselors working in Minnesota and, and as they serve in other Counseling Compact member states. Should a counselor violate laws, uh, and statuses, uh, statutes within the context of their license, the licensing board uh, in that individual's home state, so the BBHT in Minnesota, will be uh, ultimately responsible for investigation and disciplinary action. So this bill expands professional counselors' opportunities to provide life-saving care while improving access to mental health treatment within Minnesota and across the country. Uh, thank you for hearing Senate File 3355 today. Uh, uh, I'm willing to and happy to stand for any questions, and we also have legal counsel uh, attending virtually that can uh, offer insight and answer questions as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Hegblum. So, Senator Abler, I have some questions about these compact bills in general. Nothing at all pertaining to the good work that our behavioral science uh, professionals do, the goals that they have, and uh, their intentions. No, no concern or questions in regards to that. But as I've read into these um, compact bills in general, there's some things that have raised my concern in regards to rulemaking and then also data privacy. On page 17, it says member states contributing information to the data system may designate information that may not be shared with the public without the express permission of the contributing state. Uh, any information submitted to the data system that is subsequently required to be expunged by the laws of the member state contributing information shall be removed from the data system. There's no enforcement here. There's no real oversight. Um, and data privacy has become a really big issue um, in these days. In addition, it goes on on page 17 again to rulemaking that they may promulgate reasonable rules. And this is not within a state. This is a separate body uh, that would be able to make these rules um, to achieve the purpose of the compact. And it says, notwithstanding the foregoing in the event the commission exercises the rulemaking in a matter that is beyond the scope of the purposes of the compact or the powers granted here under, such an action by the commission shall be invalid and have no force or effect. Who would enforce that? Who would have effect that? This is on a national level. And it will exercise its rulemaking powers pursuant to the criteria only in this article and the rules adopted there under. Um, and they become binding as of the date specified in each rule or amendment. And it goes on with a lot of this. And you know, Mr. Senator Abler, um, in this committee, the whole rulemaking um, establishment of making rules and going around the legislature to make rules, uh, just in general, that's become increasingly a question and a concern of this committee and of the people of Minnesota in general in a variety of ways. We've heard uh, committee bills here regards to the uh, the fact that the um, MPCA would adopt the same rules as California without any input from the legislature. So increasingly, I'm just getting really, really concerned, not about the goals or the intentions or the worthiness, reminding ourselves that any of these professionals can be licensed in any of these states. Their employers can pay for their, lic their licensing as well, such as Mayo, 
and any other um, hospital system can do so and provide that reciprocity or that ability to provide that care in more than one state. There are a lot of tools that are actually available to us right now without, an, without a compact. But the reason why I'm uh, making people aware of this is I think sometimes you hear the word compact and the goals. And I agree with the goals. I'm just not convinced that this is the way to do it. And so I have concerns about this, not even with the intention that we may talk about it today, but once this goes into effect, what's going to happen down the road, the unintended consequences and uh, the oversight for some of these things, uh, the burden is going to fall upon somebody else uh, to, um, to have that. And so, Senator Abler, I'm going to ask you to um, uh, your thoughts in regards to that. And Mr. Heglum, I appreciate your being here today. I'm not putting you on the hot seat at all, and if you prefer Feel free, you don't have to stay at the testimony table if you feel preferred. Yeah. All right, all right. Thank you, Senator Abler. Well, Madam Chair, I really appreciate that, and actually, I, your concerns mirror mine. Um, and so I'm helping this group with what would be helpful, I think, to get more services available. Uh, the, um, the goal that we all agree on is worthy. Uh, I do have a question for Mr. Hedblum. Um, is every word of this bill required to pass, or do we have freedom to change parts of it? Uh, we really don't have Mr. a lot Mr. Chair, of let's just oh, wait yeah. a moment. Mr. Heglum, go ahead. Uh, there's not a, a, a lot of liberty to, to make uh, many edits outside of, I know uh, in the Civil Law Committee last week, the purpose section uh, was uh, scrutinized a bit, um, but we can't make a significant edits to the bill, and, and we might defer to the legal counsel as well for clarification. Thank you, Mr. Hegblum. My understanding, it's all or nothing. It's a compact, and uh, any changes, um, we can make those changes um, to do that, but then it would not be, um, you'd not be able to be a member of the compact, is my understanding. And Madam Chair. Senator Abler. And so, um, you, you know way more rules than I do that have run way off the rails, and I know plenty myself. Mm -hmm. And what made sense, even ones that are passed maybe 20 years ago, or that you thought were kind of quiet, mm -hmm. uh, such as the power of rules. Uh, mm -hmm. And so uh, the comfort I get, and I don't know if it's enough to persuade you, and I, committee members vote yes or no. It's just, this is a matter for the legislature to decide. But the individuals who subject themselves to this are subjecting themselves to that voluntarily. So if, if a counselor would like to be uh, under the compact rules, then they could. If they chose not to engage in the interstate work that the compact allows, they would be uh, there would be nothing changing their world at all. They would be entirely under the auspice of the, uh, the, the BB, Board of Behavioral Health and Therapy. So that's the best I can offer you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate all your good intentions and your good comments. I don't question them whatsoever. But as you know, we deal with the law on its face and, um, and what it says and where we're at in this regard. Um, we've had a request by you, Senator Abler, that we move this bill forward, and um, I'm going to honor that because I've given it a hearing. It technically can be included in the Health and Human Services bill, uh, but I'm not going to stand in the way of them being able to, um, to go forward with this bill, but I will not do it with a recommendation, is my intention, to vote it out of the committee, but without recommendation because of my concerns about this. And I would caution us as legislators, while these compacts are kind of rolling around pretty soon, it gets to be uh, the situation where we are ceding too much of our state authority to uh, compacts, um, to rulemaking in general, and other issues. And we here in the legislature, I think, responding to the people of Minnesota, and that is part of this bill, is part of that as well. But I do want to make sure that my concerns are placed upon the record and noted in that regard. Anybody else, uh, members of the committee? Senator Claussen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my concerns would, would be with the licensing of, of folks. And I know in uh, Article 2, beginning on page 4, um, there's a requirement that uh, candidates pass a nationally recognized exam. There are some general requirements. 
that uh, need to be within a program to be licensed. My, my question, though, I didn't find anything about continuing education. Could, could you comment on that? Is, is, is there a requirement for that uh, that's consistent, that there's a consistency there? Thank you. Senator Abler. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll defer Mr. to Mr. Hagelin. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Senator Klassen, for that question. Uh, that, that's a great question. So uh, I'll touch on the, the exam uh, first. Uh, that would be the National Clinical Mental Health Counselors exam that's standardized uh, across uh, states. There's actually two exams, but for a professional clinical counselor uh, to be licensed in Minnesota and, and uh, similarly, you know, mental health counselors in other states, it's this comprehensive exam that looks at skills and abilities and decision making uh, in the process. I have taken and passed the exam, and I can share that it is a, it's a thorough review of, of our knowledge. Regarding continuing education, uh, the requirements are, they differ by state, um, but I, I uh, am confident in, in responding that every state uh, has their own requirements for continuing education credits. Uh, each uh, uh, licensure renewal cycle um, and so, uh, and they focus on different areas like cultural competence, ethics, uh, um, and uh, whatever else might be interesting to the counselor that is, uh, you know, pursuing those continuing education credits. But each board would be responsible for uh, verifying the completion of those credits and auditing uh, the counselor's records as such. Thank you, Madam Chair, but just reading through the bill, that was a question that came up. And so as I understand it, this would be left up to each individual state uh, upon the time of renewing their license, what those uh, continuing education requirements would be. So there is no consistency really about number of hours or requirements of areas of study. Uh, that, that's correct. So that's where the privilege to practice really comes in, is that the license remains with the uh, within the state that the person resides and was originally licensed and this this is where uh, it is in reciprocity it's privileged to practice in other states that are member states Thank you, Madam Chair. Point taken and much appreciated. Well, and I'm glad I saved the best one for last, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you know, in this, uh, oh. I have to take care of a housekeeping issue. Sometimes I turn off my mic to uh, have conversations that I need to do with staff. I forget to turn it back on. As a result, some of the public are not hearing uh, the motions, and so we've been contacted that they've called in. So I need to be uh, real clear about the motions. One of them is a previous bill, Senate File uh, 2845, was uh, recommended to pass and, be ref and was referred to the Finance Committee. All right. As amended. All right. Thank you very much. I so appreciate the helpfulness of staff, but sometimes as we're doing this, especially as we move things around, we just want to help make sure that in the end we have everything uh, done. So members, with this, we have a, f a bill in front of us, Senate File 3129, Senator Abler, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 
it, it's been a pretty long couple of years. And the, the uh, problems applying the state are innumerable. And the challenges and what the future looks like. And so then if you ask the question, really, a state fossil, is that, is that what's going to solve all this? No. Uh, Madam Chair, it will not. Um, and, but I think it's still a good time to remember our history and to remember to build uh, what we think is important into the state uh, infrastructure. And I think if you're going to have a state fossil, you would want to have something as cool as the giant beaver. Uh, if there's, um, I mean, there's, you know, they were talking about trilobites and other ones, and the testifiers will talk about that. So a bunch of people were surveyed, and, and the giant beaver actually was the winner. And I have the state paleontologist, who I didn't even know we had one of, Madam Chair, uh, to uh, talk about this particular fossil, and then the committee can kind of make a decision if you think this is the fossil you would pick if you were going to pick a state fossil. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Abler. You know, um, today in this building and in the chamber across the street, we're going to be dealing with a lot of really, really important issues. Uh, we're going to be dealing with a bill on the floor today that has to do with the country of Ukraine and the situation they are in. Uh, we have other committees meeting today. This committee has, is hearing bills uh, as well. But in the multitasking that we are able to consider and to do, hearing the voices of Minnesota, I really thought when the Science Museum brought this uh, to my attention, especially the process by which they went through uh, and having conversations with other people that this merited a little bit of time. And gentlemen, I'm going to tell you, I know you have a, a lot that you can share, but um, briefly today in this committee, uh, to just present your information, especially the process that you went through. And with that, I'll go ahead to, um, I believe uh, we're going to have, um, I'm not sure who's going to go first. Madam if Chair, just, I, I can go. Pardon? Uh, Madam Chair, I can go. Okay, wonderful. State your name for the audio record and your title, yes. and then go ahead and proceed. Yes, Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here in support of uh, Senate File 3129, uh, where we are hoping to name the giant beaver as the state fossil. Uh, the Science Museum is very excited about this and the representation it has and vote uh, from the people of Minnesota. In the spirit of time, I am going to turn the presentation, however, however over to my, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Alex Hastings, who serves as the Fitzpatrick uh, Curator of Paleontology at the Science Museum. Thank you very much. Welcome to the committee. And again, your name and title for the audio record. Sure. I am uh, Dr. Alex Hastings. I'm the Fitzpatrick Chair of Paleontology at the Science Museum of Minnesota. Uh, we are just one of six U.S. states that does not have a state fossil. Um, and when I wanted to try and get a good choice for this, I didn't want to just pick my favorite uh, thing from Minnesota. I wanted to get the voice of Minnesota. So uh, we had an initial phase in the summer uh, where uh, put out eight really great options uh, from a spread of different parts of the state as well as different times and different kinds of ancient life. And uh, we put it out for people to be able to write in. And at that time, really the only standout was what ended up winning the ultimate vote here, the giant beaver. We had lots of other great things from fossilized bacteria to mammoths to um, giant crocodiles and sharks. Um, but what uh, won the vote by a lot was the giant beaver. Very, very clearly, very definitive, pulled out an early lead, held it all the way through. Um, so people clearly had a very strong invested interest. In the end, we got over 11,000 votes from across the state. Uh, and within that, uh, it was the very, very clear winner. Um, we did work uh, with our education as well to develop a lesson uh, that went alongside this big vote campaign that we had. And we got lots of involvement from classes across the state. Uh, through this, they learned not only about the rich fossil history of our state, but also the process of voting. They learned a great civics lesson wrapped into a fossil lesson. That uh, then led into educators being able to actually vote as a class in addition to as families. We're able to gather these votes from multiple different ways, uh, and we actually really had a big concerted effort to try and pull in as many school districts as we could across the state. So I'm very happy that we got a lot of good representation across our state, and we got a lot of people who are very enthusiastic about a giant beaver, which I think would be a phenomenal state symbol for our state, Minnesota. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Cecil. I oh, appreciate it. Yes, of course, I've got an actual jaw here of the giant beaver. This is from Minneapolis. Um, they've been found throughout the cities as well as the southern part of the state. They lived about 10,000 years ago. Um, so this puts it at the end of the last ice age. It lived alongside things like mammoths, and we had this relative of the saber-toothed cat as well. Um, and this has its big, giant incisors here. You've got the chewing teeth. Uh, so this is the left lower jaw. And then I've got a lovely cast skull from a specimen found in Blaine, Minnesota. Um, so we have a lot of good representation from around here. Thank you very much. Um, and members, I don't know if others out there as well, uh, they have a very nice um, folder about the whole project, a Minnesota State Fossil Campaign. <laughs> and um, I think for kids especially, they're fascinated by this, and it is an opportunity for them. Of course, we have many state symbols as well. Uh, frequently I've asked people what the state drink is for Minnesota, and I of course clue them in right away. It's not beer or wine or any of those wonderful things, but uh, of course in Minnesota did a wonderful job of having the state drink is milk. Very healthy <laughs> choice <laughs> for Minnesota. We've had times where kids have initiated this campaign through their schools, and I'm very glad that you involved the schools that you did in going through this process and showing how it can be an educational system as well and of interest to them. Uh, Senator Abler, I uh, appreciate um, what you have done here, and I understand also, though, the, a photograph of the giant beaver approved by the Commissioner of Natural Resources uh, will be preserved and may be displayed in the office of the Secretary of State. I thought that's interesting. The state photo is also required to be hung in the Secretary of State office. And um, I think that's a great spot for our state symbols as well. That fits well with the office. Members, any questions? All right, you've done a thorough presentation. Thank you very much, Senator Abler, and to your testifiers. I appreciate it very much. With that, members, uh, Senate File 3129 is laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and members. Okay, Senator Rood, you are next on our agenda. <laughs> Want to say thank you to everybody for the flexibility to rearrange our agenda. So, Senator Abel, did you bring the state muffin today, the blueberry muffin? <laughs> How about the state fish? Don't start. <laughs> when are we going to bring back the state? <laughs> When are we going to bring back the state dog, Madam Chair? I'm well, attaching it to Abler's bill. <laughs> That's a floor. All right, all right, very good. Well, Senator Rood, I'll move Senate File 2767 uh, to be in front of the committee today. And Senator Rood, do you have any uh, amendments today for our committee? Uh, no, Madam Chair. All right, not yet. We. Uh, so Senate filed 2767, Senator Rood to your bill and proceed with your presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is the 2022 policy and technical uh, proposal from the DNR. Each year the DNR um, proposes a suite of policy related technical changes for multiple programs that the DNR administers. Um, this bill simply makes the technical and policy changes uh, in the law that enabled the DNR to better manage its programs and natural resources. And I don't know if you have questions. It's a very uh, long um, bill. We have someone from the DNR um, if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Senator Rood. Yes, we do have testifiers um, in regards to this bill. And so um, if the DNR is here, whoever is going to testify to this, would you please come forward? Senator Rood, you, we're making you an offer for you to be here today from the DNR to testify. 
Um, but if you're just available for questions, you are. Okay, stage, that's what you're here for, is for questions? All right, okay, thank you very much. So, Senator Rood, with that, um, you have no amendment. I see no questions in regards to this bill. So, members, I will move that Senate File 2767 be recommended to pass and be referred to general orders. On that motion, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. Senator Rood. Madam Chair, if I may. Um, Senator Rood, yes. Um, out of respect for you, Madam Chair, um, I did not offer the four walleye bill limit to this bill. I didn't amend it. Um, because that bill has already passed this committee unanimously and off the Senate floor. And I know, Madam Chair, that you have heard from hundreds of people across the state of Minnesota how important that is. Um, fishing is a billion dollar industry. And today in this committee, we've heard Senate File 3129, a bill for a state fossil. Meanwhile, the state walleye, the state walleye is in trouble and needs your help. And so, Madam Chair, I would ask for the same respect for the state walleye that just you just gave the state fossil. So I'm asking um, publicly for a hearing on that bill, Madam Chair, because it's so important to the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Brood. With that, we'll move to the last bill on our agenda. Senator Nelson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator I Nelson, um, Senate File 3364, move it to place it in front of the committee at this time. Senator Nelson, to your bill. Thank you for being here today. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, Madam Chair and members, I do have the A1 amendment. Uh, this followed our stop in civil law. Uh, last week, and uh, it is a very simple amendment. It just um, includes the word uh, disputes uh, in uh, page 19. So this was um, a suggestion from, uh, from the uh, Civil Law Committee. So I'd like to uh, move the uh, amendment. Senator Nelson, I will move the A1 amendment to Senate File 3364. On that explanation and on that motion, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. The A1 amendment to Senate File 3364 is adopted. Senator Nelson, to your bill as amended. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senate File 3364 is the Audiology and Speech Language Pathology Interstate Compact. And I listened carefully and appreciated your comments on the earlier bill as well, Madam Chair. Um, well, according to uh, my Senate Council research here, um, it's it's not. Uh, let's see. It, Senate File three three six four, the review um, by the Committee on State Government, Finance, and Policy and Elections is not required under Senate rules or committee jurisdictional statement because the bill relates to an interstate agency. That's the point. Interstate agency, not a state agency. But the expertise of this committee can be very helpful as it applies to particularly two topics in the bill, Madam Chair. And I appreciate you hearing the, hearing the bill. And that is the establishment of, of a multi-member commission and the author, authoriz, um, authorization for the commission to adopt rules. And uh, Madam Chair and members, those are sections seven and nine. And if you like, Madam Chair, I will be glad to briefly go through those uh, or answer questions. Um, I should note, too, uh, just for uh, the history for this committee, uh, the bill is originally introduced in civil law, did include, include the purposes of the bill, which I think this committee is well aware of, which I'll be glad to uh, to enumerate if, if necessary. But I do want you to know that civil law removed that section of the bill because as you know, Madam Chair and members, we typically do not include purpose statements in our legislation. So that piece was removed uh, from the bill that you see today. Thank you, Senator Nelson. Uh, we'll go ahead and go to testifiers at this time. Mr. Griffin, 
Welcome to the committee. Glad to have you here today. And please proceed with your testimony after you state your name and who you're representing. Thank you, Madam Chair. Phil Griffin with Ewald Consulting, representing the Minnesota Speech Language Hearing Association. I'd like to turn to Mr. Jeremy Brown, who is our legislative committee chair, who is online for his testimony first, if I may, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Griffin. We'll go ahead to the online testifier, Mr. Brown. Uh, please state your name and who you're representing, and then proceed with your testimony. Yes, my name is Jeremy Braun. I'm a speech language pathologist, and I represent the Minnesota Speech Language Hearing Association. Um, so I primarily work in the schools in Southeast Minnesota, and some in a clinic as well. And I'm asking your support of Senate File 3364, the Interstate Compact. Um, this would this bill would allow Minnesota to be part of an interstate compact for speech language pathologists and audiologists and would allow our professions to practice across state lines in member states and also provide telehealth services in member states. Um, the ability to provide services within the compact would increase access for speech language pathology and audiology services um, in underserved and rural communities. This would also provide um, continuity of care for those clients who may spend the winter season in another state who would still like to continue to receive services from their provider. Um, on a personal note, during the pandemic, um, I work in a, in a school that's right on the border with Iowa. And um, we have students that live in Iowa and come across for um, school in Minnesota. Um, and those students that were to receive speech language pathology services when, when the pandemic first started and the shutdown happened, um, I contacted the Iowa Board of Education and they said that, you know, those students are your students, so you need to serve them. And when I contacted the Iowa Department of Health, they said, absolutely not. That would be a that would be practicing without a license. So until Governor Walls and Governor Reynolds both signed executive orders allowing across state line practices, those those kids had to not receive their services. And um, I, I hope we don't have any more situations like the COVID-19 pandemic, but um, this a bill like this would have really um, taken care of some things and allowed students to get the services they needed um, during that time. Um, so again, I, I do ask for your support in Senate File 3364. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Um, do we have another testifier, I believe, Mr. Kalfas? Oh, sorry, <laughs> Ms. Kalfas, sorry. If you'd go ahead. That's fine. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Nahali Kalfas. I'm a legal counsel at the Council of State Governments National Center for Interstate Compacts. I am uh, also a co-primary drafter of this piece of legislation, as well as the preceding one, the LPC Compact. And I'm also a prosecutor for a North Carolina uh, board of Examiners for Speech Language Pathology and Audiology. Um, I've been in that role for about 19 years, but I do this work as well as a contractor with CSG. <clears throat> I would like to just, uh, I'm here to sort of clarify some areas that are very uh, concerning areas for all states with, with good reason, but I do want to assure the, the committee that with regard to rulemaking, rulemaking is meant only to address that very narrowly tailored and authorized area of rulemaking for interstate licensure. Rulemaking by the Interstate Compact Commission can never touch areas of scope of practice or regulation of practice as that is reserved to the states. These compacts are uh, really exist under notions of federalism. State sovereignty is always retained with regard to scope of practice and regulation of that practice and ability to take away a license, much like the driver's license interstate compact. Everyone has a driver's license and it works in the same way as a mutual recognition model. What you have in your wallet is part of a interstate compact. So each state chooses to give the privilege to the person who holds a, a uh, valid state license in their home state to drive within their states. But just because you drive within that state does not mean you get to violate that state's laws. Um, you will be held accountable if you do. Um, I would also like to just say that just like with other rules for your state agencies and boards, if not authorized directly by the compact language, which again is that guardrail of interstate licensure processes, then that would be an ultra virus rule that is automatically void and unenforceable with regard to all the member states. These compact commissions actually are, they're not federal. They're not some outside agency. These compact commissions are seated by each member state's delegates. Each member state chooses who they seat on this compact commission. 
and those delegates provide the oversight necessary by the ability to vote on rules, to vote on bylaws, to vote on policy, things of that nature. These delegates participate and collectively these member states provide the oversight. There's no outside component part, not a professional association, nothing of that nature because there is a public protection concern here, obviously. Uh, the purpose statement, which doesn't have to be retained in the law, and I understand that Minnesota doesn't like to retain those purpose statements, which is why it was no problem to strike it, does speak to, obviously, greater access to competent care. And that's the crucial issue here is competent care, which is why we have these uniform set of criteria and requirements that each uh, practitioner who gains the privilege must undertake. Uh, with regard to the data system, with regard to all of the existing compacts, which, you know, there, there are six or seven um, in the healthcare fields, roughly, AMS, CIPACT, PT, um, ASLP, nursing, IMLC, which IMLC is the, the physician's compact, all of these have a data system, and each state is required to report up information to that data system. So when you see that language that speaks to whether or not a state chooses to allow that to be shared with the public, that is giving that member state the, the ability to say, we don't want this shared, but quite often what is shared up to the, to the actual data system that is for the use of the member states only, what is shared up is information as to whether or not a, a practitioner is allowed to participate in the compact, whether or not they meet the criteria, not medical health records, nothing of that nature, just whether or not they get a check or an X as to whether or not they are allowed to continue to practice across state lines. And I, I want to be respectful of your time, Madam Chair and committee members, but I do want to remain available for questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Senator Nelson, um, members of the committee, Everybody, um, so Senator Nelson, you heard what I had said before, yes. I'm sure, okay? Yes. And so I so appreciate the intentions and the good providers and all of those folks. Uh, don't question that whatsoever. I think my concern is this getting beyond what I think we're intending to do today. So I'm sharing my concerns. Um, as I've said that I would move this out without recommendation to the floor. Um, but I just want to really make it and so that all of us have our eyes wide open as to this coming and especially as we've seen these days with some of the other things that are being that are um, more heavy handed on the federal level. It isn't my concern for today, but the unintended consequences and the future that this uh, could be have an impact. That's where my concerns are coming from. So, Senator Madam Nelson, Chair, I hope I'm, that you will understand that. Mr. Griffin, did you wish to Madam make Chair, a comment? Madam Chair, if I might, I, I think your concerns are well-founded. The unintended consequences of legislation are some of the most dangerous things. But I would also like to point out the state compacts have been used for a very long time to accomplish something that I don't think we can accomplish any other way, which is to help keep the heavy hand of the federal government out of state affairs sometimes. And, the first one I worked on in 1981 was the low-level radioactive waste compact. And at the time, I was representing the physicians in this state. And I think I can safely say that without a state compact to work together as states to try and resolve a problem that really was amounting to a huge medical problem, um, we would not have been able to solve that. The federal government just wasn't capable of getting that legislation done. And compacts are a very useful tool for maintaining states' rights, and I hope that we'll continue to use them for a long time. But I appreciate your concerns, Madam Chair. <laughs> right, and I think um, those kinds of areas like that, I think um, this to me, uh, it's the time that we're in and then uh, other things. So with that, members, seeing no other discussion, I will move that Senate file 3364 uh, be referred to as amended, be referred to general orders. Uh, without recommendation. On that motion, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank, Thank you, Madam you. Chair, members. And members, we have been able to complete our agenda. I believe we have other things in front of us today. So the good thing is we'll have a hearing tomorrow as well. The pension bill will on our agenda and some other good things. And I will see you tomorrow. With that, we are adjourned. <laughs>